James Reeb's words remind us that for 200 years, Unitarian and Universalists have worked to create peace by removing the underlying causes of conflict. In 1790, Universalists gathered in Philadelphia and declared, although a defensive war may be considered lawful, we believe there is a time coming when the light and universal love of the gospel shall put an end to all wars. During the War of 1812, the Massachusetts Peace Society was founded by Unitarians Noah Worcester and William Ellery Channing. It helped launch one of the very first peace movements, and it included both those people who repudiated all violence and people who believed that sometimes war was justified. The newly formed Peace Society affirmed that not only was nonviolence humanly possible, it was all also divinely commanded. According to Channing, one of the forefathers of our American Unitarianism, quote, the citizen before fighting is bound to inquire into the justice of the cause, which he is caused, called to maintain with blood and bound to withhold his hand if his conscience condemns the cause, unquote. Since that time, Unitarians and Universalists have continued toward working for peace for, through nonviolent means. At our best, we have been on the front lines to end the violence of slavery, to promote international law, to liberate Jews and others from Nazi tyranny, and to build the United Nations. The 2006-2010 study action issue for the Unitarian Universal Association asked the question, should the Unitarian Universalist Association reject the use of all kinds of violence in war to resolve disputes between peoples and nations and adopt a principle of seeking just peace through only nonviolent means. Reverend Paul Razor in an issue of UU World responded to this question as follows. I begin with a fundamental commitment to nonviolence. Unitarian Universalists have always affirmed peace as among our most basic values. We have always worked to create the kinds of just communities out of which peace emerges. And we have long supported the use of nonviolent methods of conflict resolution. This is a legacy we share with pacifism. At the same time, Unitarian Universalism has always been an engaged religion, one that tries to make a difference in the world. An important part of this engagement is our tradition of speaking prophetically, of bringing reason, judgment, and critique to bear on the social connection, connections that generate injustice and violence. In the context of war, this commitment has been well served by the justified war model. 75 years was not that long ago, and given the magnitude of the Second World War, it would be a safe bet that everyone joining us in the service this morning has some story connected to this unique time in history. Earlier this week, a number of you contributed a, a, contributed a story of world, from World War II and how it affected you or your family. And what I think are truly stories for all ages, I'd like to share a few of those contributions with you. Several members of our congregation have shared stories of their fathers who served in the military. Stephen shares the story of his father, Albert, who finished his medical training in 1933, just before Hitler made it impossible for Jewish doctors to fully practice medicine in Germany. He had the good fortune to immigrate to the United States in 1936 and became a US citizen in 1941. In 1943, he volunteered as a medical officer in the United States Army, and with the Seventh Army, progressed from North Africa through Italy and France, reaching Germany in 1945. When after victory in Europe Day, he visited his hometown, Odenheim, which is near Heidelberg, he was recognized by many inhabitants. Look, it's the Guggenheim's Albert, they said. They suggested that he return to Odenheim and become mayor. He declined, 
but he did order some prisoners of war to clean and restore the gravestones, including those of his parents that the Germans had vandalized in the nearby Jewish cemetery. Linda P. recalls seeing her father sent off to war for three years. In her words, I remember standing long ago with my mother and brother and singing, anchors away, my boys, as my father and hundreds of other sailors marched onto a vast ship headed to North Africa. We were saluting and adding our small voices to an immense crowd. I was proud, but also sad to see my tall father leaving us again. At last, our father returned, but health issues caused a stay of weeks at the Naval Hospital where children were not allowed to visit. When he finally came home, he really never talked to us young ones about his war experiences. Now I know this, that silence was all too common among returning veterans. So many untold stories. Sandra also found that her dad, Lawrence, even 50 years after the war was reluctant to talk about his experience as a pilot of a B-24 bomber, but enjoyed sharing other stories such as ignoring military protocol and telling his crew to call him Larry instead of Lieutenant and stories about the frustration of trying to find beer in North Africa. And Susan B shares a personal letter from her dad to her mom in January, 1943, on the birth of her brother. Her dad was stationed in Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone with the Seabees. He did not tell her mom that he was very sick with malaria. From the letter, dear Jeannie Gal, I couldn't be prouder or happier, and I know you're happy too. Keep that way, and it won't be a long wait. Hope the flowers are pretty. I wish they were orchids. Send me a picture of the baby, and you as soon as you can. I know our baby is the handsomest this side of the Red Bridge. Lucky little devil, too, with a pretty mother like you. Boy, it'll be a great day when I see the two of you. Have a good rest, darling, and tell the baby the old man will be home soon to, get, to soon start getting acquainted. There's nothing to worry about, Jeannie. Remember, I love you with all my heart and soul, and keep your chin up and light in the window. With all my love, Don. Susan's dad recovered and went on to take a commission in the Navy, where he served in the intelligence service, working on breaking Russian codes and coming, up, coming across Siberia. Some members shared how they remember doing their part. Jack D shared a story that took place when he was a little kid in Pittsburgh during the war. In his words, I was a neighborhood captain in charge of collecting tin cans and newspapers for the war effort. A bunch of us kids would pick up the cans, peel off the wrappers, use can openers to cut the bottoms off and squash them. We would take them to nearby collection points on a given day. And Linda P shared that in Washington DC, she and other kids competed on daytime walks to school to find old cigarette cartons in the street gutters. From these, she said, we harvested the silver foil to add to our large accumulation to send away for the war. And Cheryl remembered, I was six when the war ended. Butte held a big parade, maybe for the fourth. I was dressed as a nurse. My brothers and cousin were soldiers, sailors, and Marines with authentic child uniforms. Our float was a large boat, probably larger in my memory, my child memory. It was fun and exciting. Several members reported the experience of living through the possibility of an air raid. Linda P describes the sirens in Washington DC. At night, the air raid sirens would scream and our mother rushed to pull down shades and turn out all of the lights. The city went dark in fear of German bombs and we young children were scared too. And according to Jack D back in Pittsburgh, we lived continuously in blackout brownout modes. We had air raid wardens that would patrol the streets at night checking for violations. My brother and I had fun sometimes sneaking out and prowling around the immediate area hoping not to get caught. 
And finally, this unique story comes from Robin. Our family pet Dalmatian was drafted into the army as an experiment in using ordinary pet dogs. We were living in Mandan, North Dakota, and there was an army recruiter who had to make a monthly quota of dogs for the draft. One day, he came for our Dalmatian, Fritzi. By the time I was born in 1945, Fritzi had been returned to us with an honorable discharge and a docked tail. We never learned why he had been charged, discharged before the end of the war. But I read later that the army learned Dalmatians were targets at night, so they were not suited for guard duty. Although he was a really smart, protective, wonderful family dog, we were told never to say, go get him, because that meant to kill. And we could not play with toy guns because Fritzy would grab your wrist until you dropped the gun. A special thank you to all the persons remembered through these stories and to you contributors. 75 years ago, May 8th, marked the end of World War II in the European theater. The war in the Pacific ended in late August and early September, 1945. Today on Memorial Day Sunday, we want to honor those who fought and gave their lives to stop the forces of evil in battle and in standing up to justice, injustice. We also want to remember what circumstances allowed those forces of evil to take root and spread. In August, 2019, Lauren Katzenberg wrote in the New York Times, what will happen as the horrors of the Second World War, which were once at the forefront of the American psyche, fade from the country's collective memory? Already there are clues that many have forgotten. In 2018, the Times reported on a survey that showed 41% of Americans didn't know what Auschwitz was, and 52% thought Hitler came to power through force. But in fact, he came to power through a series of elections, coalitions, and appointments. And in July 2019, a high school principal in Florida was fired for refusing to state that the Holocaust was an actual event. The message never forget applies, of course, to the murderous anti-Semitic regime of Adolf Hitler in Nazi Germany. Their desire to destroy anyone who did not conform to their idea of an Aryan super race led to war and the death of millions. But we must also never forget the millions of people from around the world who joined together and stood up to fascism. Many did so with their lives. We should feel pride that we have Unitarian ministers who truly walked the walk during the war. Perhaps the most notable was Reverend Norbert Capek from Prague. By the beginning, beginning of World War II, he was a major force building the Unitarian Church in Prague. It had 3,200 members. It was the largest Unitarian congregation in the world. From his pulpit, he preached resistance to the coming occupation. In his words, we are today the only nation in the whole of Europe that is ready to resist oppression. Confronting our descendants, we will never have to feel ashamed of the fact that as a small nation in the middle of Europe, we were ready to defend human dignity, freedom and justice from violence, lies and lawlessness. This he said in 1938. In March, 1941, Kapek and his daughter Zora, age 29, were arrested by the Gestapo. They were charged with high treason because they listened to foreign broadcasts and Kapek used some of what he learned in his sermons. The Gestapo sent him to Dachau and his daughter to forced labor in Germany. He died in 1942, killed by poison gas. Another important Unitarian minister during the war was Reverend Waite Still Sharp and his wife Martha, a social worker. They spent six months in Prague in 1939, distributing money and helping intellectuals escape to the United States. After narrowly avoiding arrest in Prague and returning to the US, the couple traveled to Lisbon and Southern France to distribute food and to help Jews and others escape. 
Martha organized a transport of children to the United States, which became a model for later transports of child refugees. When World War II ended, many people in the war-torn world worked collaboratively to put into place alliances to help prevent another world war. They included institutions such as the United Nations, NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, economic collaborations that led to the EU, the European Union. These and other alliances were designed to help resolve military, economic, and political conflicts that arose between nations before they reached the point of violence. But sadly, the reasons for these alliances seem to be fading from memory, just as many people seem to have forgotten about the horrors of the Holocaust. I know that we, Unitarian Universalists, as well as people from other faiths and cultures around the world are concerned about the rise of nationalism. When England voted in 2016 to leave the European Union, referred to as Brexit, some of the leaders of Brexit argued that economic hardship was a small price to play, pay for national pride. Had they forgotten that the EU's very existence was to help prevent another major conflict between European countries? And sadly, in this country, the head of our government has convinced at least one third of the American people that in order to make America great again, we should go it alone. As a result of this belief, the United States has been pulled out of international alliances for defense, the Paris Climate Accord, and as recently as this week, our leadership has threatened to take away support for the World Health Organization during a worldwide pandemic. There are many things we should not forget about World War II, but one of the most important is that we should not forget the perils of nationalism, putting one's own country before everything else. If people in most countries become convinced that only their country, their culture, and their religion matter, then they have forgotten the lessons that came from the war. On May 3rd, Reverend Duffy talked about current threats to the ideals of democracy. These threats include losing our ability to solve conflicts peacefully, a belief that connects back to the Unitarians who formed the Massachusetts Peace Society during the war in 1812. Nationalism is clearly one of those threats. What can we do to help others remember the lessons from World War II? As Unitarian Universalists, we can keep alive the stories of people in our faith who stood up to bullies. We can keep alive the stories from our families. We can keep reminding ourselves and others that national pride co coupled with arrogance and oppression only fan the flames of conflict. And as Pete Seeger, one of my favorite people asked in where have all the flowers gone? Gone to graveyards, everyone. When will we ever learn? When will we ever learn? Thank you, Sandra. When it came to learning, like any child, I made a lot of mistakes. Some I regretted, although most I've written off as part of growing up. I broke things, I forgot things, I got into quarrels with my siblings. Regardless of the magnitude of my mistake, if my mother got involved, it would usually end up with her asking me, did you learn anything? As I grew older, I realized my mother asked this question a lot, and not just to me. In most cases, her question was rhetorical. She wanted to make a point rather than to get an answer. Outside of our family, the person she asked might not even hear the question. Maybe it was the driver of the car she, saw la she last saw speeding by on a neighborhood street, only to see the same driver a few blocks later with the flashing red lights of a police car parked behind it. Maybe the question was muttered while reading the newspaper or framed as, geez, did we learn anything while watching the evening news? Tomorrow is Memorial Day, the American holiday set aside to honor the men and women who died while serving in the United States military. In June, 1944, when my mother was just 12 years old, her parents sat her down 
and told her that her older brother, a pilot serving in Europe in World War II, was missing in action. But don't worry, said her mother, always the optimistic parent. If anyone can find his way back, it's your brother. The following year, her father received a letter dated exactly one year and one day after my mother's brother went missing. The War Department has entertained the hope that he survived, began the letter, but in view of the fact that 12 months have now expired without the receipt of evidence of survival, it concluded, we must terminate, terminate such absence by a presumptive finding of death. And with that letter, my mother, her sister, and her parents officially became a gold star family, representing just one of more than 400,000 American lives lost in the Second World War. I'm sure, as I mentioned before, everybody in today's service has a Memorial Day connection, and not just with World War II, but with conflicts both before and after. Rather than a holiday, store-wide sale or a celebration for the unofficial start of the summer, Memorial Day should probably have a subtitle. Never forget. 10 years ago, the village in Normandy, France, where my uncle's plane crashed, wanted to put a plaque on a memorial in their park with his name on it. I called my mother and asked her what she would like written on the plaque. After a lengthy pause, she finally responded. Geez, did we learn anything? Her answer wasn't just about her brother. His death, it turns out, was just one of an estimated 60 million deaths worldwide, both civilian and military. 60 million people in just six years during the Second World War. The Nazi regime alone was responsible for an estimated 11 million civilian deaths in their concentration camps. And of this number, six million were Jews. Roughly two thirds of the world Jewish population was killed during the horrific six years of World War II. I knew what my mother was asking then, and I think it's an excellent question now. In addition to the war's end, it has been 75 years since Auschwitz, Dachau, Bergen-Belsen, and the many other concentration camps were liberated and closed. In the 2018 New York Times survey, Sandra mentioned 41% of American respondents did not know what Auschwitz was. And it's not just the US. Shortly before the New York Times report, the Anti-Defamation League, after conducting 53,000 interviews in 102 different countries and territories, found that just 54% of people around the world have ever heard of the Holocaust, and nearly a third believe it is a myth or overblown. On the flip side, in Germany today, every high school student is required to visit the site of a concentration camp as part of their World War II curriculum and the devastating worldwide impact of the rule of Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party. It has also been 75 years since families and countries around the world, like mine and yours, sent their daughters and sons to war. And perhaps most significant, in a few months, it will be 75 years since this war and all of the tragic side stories that came with it ended. Did we learn anything? I like to think so. Within our own community, as Unitarian Universalists, we chose we choose to be a peace site. Our church and grounds when we gather are to be peaceful and used to promote peace. One of the seven principles to which our congregation affirms and promotes is the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. And more importantly, the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Maybe this world is like the child who made the mistake. In the Second World War, there were some big mistakes, but maybe this world learns something, just one thing to cause some pause in preventing the atrocities of this magnitude from ever happening again. The Diary of a Young Girl, probably known best to all of us as the Diary of Anne Frank, 
documents the life of a young Jewish girl and her family while in hiding in Holland from 1942 to 1944. Published after the war in over 60 languages, over 35 million copies of the book have been sold and it continues to be one of the great resources and reminders to the world of the Holocaust, perhaps the biggest mistake ever. Ms. Frank died in a concentration camp in 1945 at the age of 15. I'm gonna close with a quote from her diary wrote shortly before Anne and her family's hiding place was betrayed. What is done cannot be undone, but one can prevent it happening again. In her own way, perhaps Anne was responding to the question, did we learn anything? The short two word answer and the theme for today's service as well as Memorial Day. Never forget. <laughs>